Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Wanzheimer Gallery. I'm a big proponent of getting to show on the road when you say you're going to, because you know some of us have long drives, and I just really appreciate everyone coming tonight. So Francis and I are going to have a discussion slash interview of each other, talking about art and community. And for those of you who don't know who Frances Anderton is, she tells stories and distills ideas about design, arch architecture, and the cityscape of Los Angeles in print, broadcast media, and public events. She's the author of Common Ground, Multifamily Housing in Los Angeles, <laughs> which of course she didn't bring a copy. No, actually but I did, but I appreciate I did. it. <laughs> uh, we're gonna talk about that. It's, uh, she's a winner of a gold award for best regional nonfiction from Forward Reviews. She has co-produced short films for the nonprofit housing developers, Community Corporation of Santa Monica and Venice Community Housing. And she is currently researching awesome and affordable quotes, housing as a fellow of Friends of Residential Treasures, Los Angeles. She writes a regular newsletter, which I advise everyone to get on. Um, it's on design and architecture, but so much more, including a lot of art. She does this through KCRW, public radio station, for which she previously hosted the show for many years, DNA, Design and Architecture. Honors include the Esther McCoy Award from the Architectural Guild of USC School of Architecture for her work educating the public about architecture and urbanism. Please welcome Frances Anderton <laughs> to the Wildfire Gallery. <laughs> Sorry, I'm already sitting down. I'm so comfortable in these chairs oh, well, that the gallery yes. has provided. I'm just already settled in. But thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Anne, because I thought that as I was coming here that I was going to be in, in, in introducing you and, and uh, interrogating you, but it's actually, you've, you've so graciously introduced me and we're going to have a lovely two-way exchange. And I should say that one, you know, all of you, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's Friday, it's, you know, the holidays around the corner and I've, it's just so lovely to see you all here. And any of you that, would like to come closer to the front, you know, please do, because we're going to chat for a bit and then we definitely want this to be a, a, an open conversation. Um, but, um, but Anne is the perfect person to talk about this topic of um, sort of building community, particularly when one's in, um, on one's own journey as an artist, you know, you're not sort of going to the workplace where you have sort of inbuilt community. So anyway, I say that Anne is perfect to talk about this because, because in fact, starting from the moment I met Anne, I understood that for Anne, there was her art practice and there was this other piece of her art practice, which is building community. So can I start there? Sure. Anne, and then we'll go on, we'll get into sort of why we both think this, this matters. Now, you know, can as, all as of you pursuit. hear us? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I think many of you are friends of Anne's or admirers of her work. So maybe you've had the same experience as I did. But I basically, um, Anne just reached out to me out of the blue. And I think well, you emailed me or did you Instagram me first or something? And then you just, I think, invited me to a dinner or to lunch in San Pedro. You said, come and meet me in San Pedro. I like to meet people you, want, you know, you'd, you'd like to talk with. And you were just very direct about it. And I love directness and I love, I've spent a life going up to people I don't know and just saying, can I talk to you? So when you did this, it was like, oh, here's a kindred spirit. You do what I do. And so I completely recognize that. And it was like, sure, you sound interesting and you look and your work looks interesting. So off I went to San Pedro to meet you for lunch. And that's where we met. Have I remembered this correctly? Well, what I remember <laughs> is that you were interviewing someone who had coordinated a project called Cardboard City. Oh, that's right. In Santa Monica. Okay. And I somehow got the memo that I was going to be interviewed on KCRW. 
Oh, that's right. And I was really excited about it. But as it turns out, uh, the person that was one of the coordinators of Cardboard City, which was through a resource organization in Rediscover, in, Rediscover in Venice, uh, was the kingpin or the on the board of directors, and he knew Francis, and he roped her into interviewing him with some of the artists. And he sort of took center stage. <laughs> and what I thought was the most fascinating thing about then there were maybe six of us, was how interested and how curious Francis was about this particular, the Rediscover program and Cardboard City. And so, and I guess I got to say a few words so that when I reached out to you, uh, I reached out just to thank you and to say you've saved the interview because otherwise I thought it was a little dull because it was really just this one person going on and on. <laughs> and then you said something complimentary about something that I had said and that you suggested we meet. God, isn't that funny? Yeah, that's how. It shows that, yes. that our memories are, are, <laughs> are you know, we, well, basically, that is absolute proof that we all live our own truths, you know? Because <laughs> I just remember this very bold outreach. But yeah, absolutely, that was Cardboard City, and you had a piece of yours in Cardboard City. Yes, that is all absolutely correct. And we discover, actually, funnily enough, is in itself doing a little bit of what we're talking about tonight. We discovered a great little organization over in Culver City, Santa Monica, you know, and now they're in, um, they've, they're now, they've got a new space in actually in a building that's a really great example of affordable housing. And Rediscover is now on the ground floor of that building. And funnily enough, because our topic is community, they've got this new space, it's in this mixed use building families and senior housing built by, um, I'm forgetting which of the nonprofit developers, but architect Kevin Daly, Rediscover chose to put their space there. So now the kids will be coming from school, playing, learning, art, making with cardboard in the Rediscover space. And the folks who are living in the building can kind of be part of it or at least feel the energy. You know, so it's actually very nice. So we discover definitely sees themselves as doing something more than more than just the work with the with the cardboard. But anyway, so you and I, that's exactly right. That's how that's how we met. And what was what's very interesting is um, I definitely have spent, you know, many decades kind of interviewing people. So I pepper people with questions, but you do the same thing. So I went to lunch and you peppered me with questions. But anyway, so since then we have gotten to know each other, but because Anne lives in San Pedro and I'm up in um, LA, you know, living kind of on the West side, but but not exclusively focused on the West side by any by any stretch. But, but, but anyway, what's What's really interested me about you is how very proactive you are about creating community. And you do it by reaching out to individuals. You do it by creating um, venues for people to get together. You create events. Sort of tell me why you do that. And because it's kind of a project in itself. It's a sport. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good way to and, put it. Um, well, for instance, whenever I have a studio visit, it comes with lunch. And because everyone's been driving for some di distance, and usually, you know, they're coming between 10 and 2, and they're not going to get their lunch, so I always make something. I'm a former caterer, so for me, it, it's actually an easy thing. But I also think that if you're not a caterer, then you you certainly can go get some takeout. So I think that's one. It's a very generous. It's a generous thing to do for people, and it makes you memorable. And I also moved to Los Angeles when I turned sixty-five, and I came here because I ran into a friend in twenty fifteen, and he told me he I, this was in the Bay Area, and he moved down here to Los Angeles. And he said he'd had more attention for his artwork in eight months than 12 years in San Francisco. 
And I said, oh, shoot, I'm, I missed the bus. I, I'm too old to move. And, um, but then the next day, I woke up and I said, well, you're only 65. You've got 20 years left. So why don't you sublet your studio and uh, go see what's what? And I had one friend down here in Santa Monica, and I called her up and I said, Joni, can I, uh, can I crash in your, on your uh, futon uh, for a month or so while I find a studio? And she said, sure. So that was, that was one thing. Another friend that I've had for many, many years. So that was the one thing that enabled me to be able to come down here and at least search. I found a studio within a couple of months, within 30 days. And um, the thing that I found about Los Angeles is that there were a lot of opportunities. And, but I had to go after them. Opportunities for work or for, opportunities for, for my work. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had a big, long list of people that had given me people to contact. And it also felt very open-hearted because it felt like there was the networking that happens in the movie business felt like it transferred over to the art business so that pe their people wanted to meet my people and my people wanted to meet their people. And I, I, for instance, I, I met someone who was also represented at the gallery I was in in San Francisco and he lived down here and he said, oh, let's, let's go to lunch and I'll invite Jeannie uh, Denholm from Scape Gallery where I show. And, uh, and I thought, boy, oh boy, is that ever generous? Because in the Bay Area that nobody, it's a small pie and people are very um, protective of their spaces. Even my teachers in graduate school, unlike here, it also felt like all the teachers, John Baldessari, and we're, we're always pushing their artists out into, into New York and other places. So it felt like this city was very welcoming. So, um, and another thing that I have done is, first of all, I'm single. My child is raised. I've had a couple of husbands that didn't work out very much as far as being financially stable. I was, but I'd rather be financially unstable and not be limited very much because they don't really like dinner parties or they don't really want to have artists in residence coming and living in the house and sharing the other bathroom. So um, I've been single for about 20 years. So that really is another reason for me to create community because you get lonely, you're isolated. And so for me, one of the things I did was to have dinner parties, which I had done in the Bay Area as well. And I, sometimes I had a, a, a host and we would each choose like three or four people. And we always wanted to have artists, curators, writers, uh, and to bring people to the table that we didn't always necessarily know. And come to find out, almost everybody wants a free meal. And down here, a, a home cooked free meal um, is even more of an invitation. Um, so that is, that is one way that I have really connected. But the other thing is I have lived in communal housing situations. Even when I was married, I lived in this small town in the Bay Area called Canyon, which is one of the last rural communities inside a metropolitan area in the country. And we didn't we, we were off the grid. Well, not really. We had electricity, but we had, to, we had to pave our own roads. We had to run our own water systems, and we took turns doing this. And we also had a public school with about 70 kids in it. The population was about 250. And we had come from New York City, and we couldn't live in a regular neighborhood so we wanted something more extreme and a good friend of mine had lived there. So that was one of my introductions to communal living. I mean, we, it wasn't communal, but we all really relied on each other. We had our own homes, um, but there were a lot of kids and there were, you were, you know, kids would come to your house. My kid would go to their house. Um, 
it was a lot of cooperation. So that brings me into wanting to talk about your book, Francis, <laughs> and it's called Common Ground, Multi-Family Housing in Los Angeles. So I would like you to talk a little bit about that experience. Well, thank you so much for, for asking about it. And I will say that um, it's probably precipitated in part by by concern with some of the same things. You know, we live in a fragmented world and we've developed a land use, land use patterns and a lifestyle that really can create, you know, quite a lot of isolation. And um, I'm not sure, I think we're, as a society, we're starting to sort of see the consequences of that, you know, and the pandemic only reinforced it. There's obviously, a, we all know there's, you know, a lot of health issues, mental health issues that have been as associated with, with, with extended periods of isolation that that caused. So anyway, I guess around about the time of the pandemic, I was also um, making a move out of my full-time position at KCRW. I had become extremely interested in housing, just as an issue in general, um, uh, because obviously it's a crisis point in LA. Uh, LA's at an inflection point as it struggles with kind of leaving behind the old model of LA, which is the garden city, the low rise car based lifestyle, which is inherently finite. There's a good number of people that wish it was infinite because the alternative is not what they want because it's mass transit and it's less parking spaces and it's more people and a concentrated space. And it's a bit, it, you know, the density is a dirty word. And that's the LA that we're, we're right in the middle of right now. It's definitely in a, in a process of, of transition. There's a lot of friction. And at KCRW, we found ourselves more and more covering the fights around housing. And I always felt the kind of undertow to all the arguments over um, the measures that were being put on the ballot to try and stop de the anti-density measures, the fights between the Yimbis and the Nimbis and the Fimbis and the... Um, the um, it was getting it was getting really really get, getting to a place of a, a sort of cultural struggle across cultural struggle and the and the and the, the undertow to so many of these conversations that I was hearing um, was that you know there was a kind of um, the 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 high status or the 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 ultimate expected way of, of living in America was the owner occupied single family home, that's what people want. And anything else is less than, and certainly apartment living in LA is, is kind of less than, except that the majority of people in LA numerically live in apartments or some form of multifamily building. And certainly the majority of Angelinos, both in the city and the county are actually renters. Now, and that kind of overlaps, renters and apartments. And also sometimes you rent a house and sometimes you buy a condo, but, but more or less there's a point where, the, the numbers prove that actually the real LA is not the one that we think is the LA. And I myself and my little family, we live, have lived for years in an apartment, a six unit apartment building in Santa Monica, which is a, which is a, it's a lovely place to live. And yet as our daughter got older and got into her teens and she discovered her friends all lived in large houses north of Montana, she became very, very embarrassed about where she lived. And then that turned into a kind of anger against her parents for bringing her up in this, in this dreadful situation, you know, where we weren't living in the single family house, even though she would go to her friend's houses and feel kind of like they were sort of empty and over large and lonely. And she was actually happy in our building. And she actually had, she's an only child and there were two households where there was also only children so she could hang with the other children and then Steve and Sharon upstairs who don't have children were kind of like surrogate parents to her and so there's all sorts of, and then she could walk to school there were these other advantages but anyway still I was really struck by the difference between her lived experience which was very pleasant and her perception of her lived experience which was very negative and I felt that's actually out there in the culture. She's absorbing something that's in the culture at large. And it's, and it's what I was, I was also seeing over and over again, playing out in these struggles over density. So I just thought I've, I've got to get in, I've got to drill down into this. So hence the book, it's a look at a hundred years of housing types in LA 
that really support the kind of lifestyle that we were having, the bungalow court, the garden apartments. And we have so many of these places in LA. LA is so rich in community-oriented places, and they can be really intensively community-oriented, like you know, an arts community like the brewery or something just, just near here. Or they can be a loose-knit group of folks that have found themselves together as just fellow tenants, like our building. Um, or they can be, one of the examples I have in the book, Tom and Bill, who are a couple who wound up, Bill has sadly passed since the, since the publication of the book, but Tom and Bill wound up with five lots with little cottages on all the lots, except the one they were on, which was their house. And they decided to bring in a landscape designer and just turn the entire four lots, five lots, into a garden, basically a shared garden in which all these people that were just these, just these tenants, just residents, they found themselves in a place. They put in little, little garden areas, a long dining table here, a barbecue pit here, a private little space here. And the place is completely magical. It's like completely magical. It's, it's sort of a dream. It's, it's a bit, bit like what you, what, what you were describing that you lived in, in the, um, the somewhat communal environment. It's smaller, it's obviously smaller, so anyway, there's degrees of intentionality. Sometimes it's just the architecture does it. It's just a bungalow court. You are forced to say hello to your neighbor just by going up the alley to get to your house. Sometimes it's much more intentional, like where you were, and, and there's other kinds of environments. Sometimes it's senior housing where there's amenities that are custom designed for the seniors that live there. There's all ways in which it can shape, it can take, take shape, but whatever it is, it's, it's in a world of, in a megalopolis with millions of people where it is so easy to, to spend days on your own. Um, you, you can have a, just a way of life that, that, that gives you co company, just company. And I think that's what you're sensing. You're mm -hmm. sensing there's so many different types of households these days. As you've said, you've been through a number of different types of households. And it sounds like your two husbands didn't even fully get who you were because they didn't want the dinner parties either. <laughs> they didn't want the dinner parties and you did. They didn't want the artist in residence and you did. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like even when you had company, it wasn't necessarily company that was reinforcing the kind of company that you felt was important. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think, so does that sum up the book? That's sort of what the book's about. Mm -hmm. But I do feel, I do feel we've spent a hundred years experimenting with this, with this world that we've created with the car. And the car has many, it's many things that are fun and exciting about the car. I'm not gonna deny the car mm -hmm. per se, although I do like walking and riding a bike, but I'm not gonna deny the car. But I will say the, the, the sort of environments that we've created by, being able to disperse ourselves and then, and then in addition, siloing our lives. So there's industry over here and there's housing over here and then housing is subdivided into single family over here and apartments over here. And this siloing that we do um, is also another piece of the puzzle that we're, I think we're trying to fix or, we, or grappling for some sort of fix. Is, do you think that's, sort of partly what you're also maybe maybe even unconsciously dealing with is kind of a physical separation because you're in San Pedro you have a community of artists in San Pedro but you want you want to be part of the regional community I do don't you? I do um, and let me think what I want to talk about um, I live in a single family house and, but I do have tenants. And, uh, but after reading this book, I really felt that I wanted to be part of a, of a bigger group and not just in an apartment building, but in something that is really connected. Um, although right before I moved here, I was living in a, um, a warehouse that was uh, called the 45th Street Artist Cooperative three buildings owned by 56 artists that had been around for about almost 50 years. 
And initially, it was just people just got, a, got into the space and put up sheetrock and ran extension cords and, and uh, divided up the space. And then somebody, you know, some couple decides they're not going to be together. But then so then they divide their space up and put up another um, to put up a, 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 another wall. So it just kind of kept uh, migrating into different kinds of living situations. Um, but I wanted to come in from the country and um, I was tired of country living. My career was starting to move forward a little bit to have a truck come out and pick up my work was getting to be more complicated. So I wanted to have more of an urban experience. And my daughter had also been raised. Um, so moving from the rural community into the, into the city, into Emeryville and Oakland, um, I was trying to figure out how I could get into this cooperative. Uh, because you buy in at a very low price, I had a, ultimately a 1,600 square foot loft um, that I paid 88,000 for, which was, you know, this was in the year 2000, oh, about 2008 or nine. And, um, and then 10 years later, I sold it for the same price. So we kept the price, we had bylaws that did not allow anyone to sell their unit as a profit. So, so it's limited equity. Yes, I guess that's what it was mm -hmm. called. So people had a very clear idea. E even this was a warehouse district in Emeryville, but people had no idea that, that the area was going to blow up like it did when they first started it. But it was a really good thing that they kept that. So I was peripatetic for a couple of years. I had bought a tear down in Canyon after one of my marriages, the second marriage fell apart. And um, so I, I had bought this tear down, didn't tear it down. I bought it for $100,000. And I think sometimes it's important to talk about money because most often you have no idea how people are enabled to be artists. Um, especially if you're single and especially if you don't have an inheritance or a trust fund or a, a, you, you weren't in the service and, and uh, have a pension. So I bought this house, fixed it up, lived in it for a number of years with my child, and then I rented it out while my kid went to college so that I could pay for her fees. She and she and her dad and I split her college in thirds. Chico State, Chico State, very reasonable, about 3,500 a year then. And uh, so I was peripatetic and I stayed with, I, I slept around, I say, for about three years with relatives, with friends, who somebody was had a two room apartment, he was saving up for graduate school. So uh, I took the living room and he took his studio and put a cot up there. And uh, so that was for about six or eight months. And then I found a sublet in this cooperative and I, that's really what I had my eye on. And so I thought, well, I moved into someone who sublet and then I thought, well, how am I going to introduce myself around and get to know some of the people here? So I read some article in the New York Times about somebody that had like, you know, takeout chicken Tuesday or something. And I thought, well, I'm going to do Weber's Whiskey Wednesday. And so I bought a bottle of, of Rebel Yell from Trader Joe's. What is that, about $10? made a bunch of popcorn, and um, and so I just put up signs around the complex and the different buildings. So people, a lot of people came out of curiosity. And when I think about the co-op and these 56 article artists, I feel like there wasn't a cooperative bone in anybody's body. And it was really more like living in a zoo. So I, I think your idea of a different kind of multifamily units where there's all different kinds of people and not just one group 
might be a better kind of a situation. But however it was, it was a great situation for about 10 years. So that's sort of another one of my examples. And then I did, when a studio became available, I did apply for it. I didn't get it. And undeterred, I stayed with my aunt for a few more months. And then, you know, eventually another studio came up that was available. And I applied for it, and that one I got. And it was a beautiful studio. So um, I think that was another example of how you just have, kind of have to throw yourself out there and make bold moves in order to make things happen. Which I do admire you for. I mean, it's tremendously courageous because it's, it, it's, it's hard, especially when you come to a new place, and especially when you you know, don't have somebody at home just to even just just give you the encouragement, you know. I mean, good, mm -hmm. good for you. But the thing about the housing and the kind of intentional community, I, I, I think we should stay with that point a bit longer because I actually do think it's really relevant to the creation of art communities or, mm -hmm. or supporting artists. You know, there's the, the Fair Housing Act actually kind of precludes building housing and then saying it's only for this kind of person. There's a few groups, however, that can, for whom housing can be designated. So veterans, for example, seniors, um, uh, people with perhaps with physical and uh, mental health disabilities, you know, with supportive services. And then there's, I haven't quite figured out how the loophole works, but then there's artists. You can actually build communities for artists. And I think you can only, I think they get around the Fair Housing Act because it's live work. I think that's what differentiates it. However, the fact, what you've just said, about the, about the fact that having birds of a feather, you know, birds of a feather all under the same roof, perhaps not necessarily being ideal, is kind of quite interesting because we do sort of assume that that, that will make for, for a happy community is when people are of like mind. But, but is that true? You're sort of saying, you know, perhaps not. And, and in fact, I don't know if anyone remembers you know, one's, one's kind of view, one kind of one's worldviews are sort of shaped by various different things that you sort of pick up on over your life. And I know definitely that one of the things that always lurked in the back of my mind as a kind of desirable way to live was Armistead Mopan's Tales of the, Tale of, Tales of the City, actually about Haight Ash, Ashbury in San, San Francisco, Francisco back in the 70s. And I was young. And I would devour these books. I've never watched the TV show, but I, wa I read the books, every single one. And I absolutely loved this vision of a hodgepodge of eccentrics that came together in this house under the watchful eye, you know, of the, um, of the, stern, of the stern landlady. And, and I, I, I loved those books and I love what they portrayed. And that, that was a more organic, coming together of people who kind of muddled along but found themselves forming community. An intentional community is a really interesting phenomenon and it really can be fraught. It actually can be a kind of living hell. I mean, I definitely found that because I interviewed, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I interviewed, so I, I don't think she'd mind me talking about it, but one of the examples I have in the book of more intentional community is LA Eco Village, which is an incredible place in a lot of ways. That is a limited equity um, um, uh, uh, co cooperative, um, co housing, it's co housing. Lois Arkin, who's a formidable person who wanted, she left a marriage that wasn't in any way s supporting her, her just kind of emotionally, philosophically, whatever. She wanted, she discovered the idea of co housing back in the 80s. She, she became one of the leaders in LA. It's got a bunch of people and they've created this place that has 40 households over, over a sort of East Hollywood. <laughs> anyway, at a certain point, they had to literally bring in, um, what are they called? Well, it's like group therapists. They had to bring mediators. in mediators. They had to bring in mediators <laughs> to sort out the struggles because there were so many meetings. There was so much kind of having to diplomatically or, or, or democratically decide on every little thing that it wound up being very fraught. And it even got to things like it was an eco community, but not, not everybody um, 
agreed on whether they should have air conditioning units. And there's like a group that wanted the air conditioning units and the group that felt absolutely not. This is a green eco community. You don't have air conditioning units. And so they would, they would have these pitch battles. Now in my building where we're just showering upstairs was an air, air hostess, you know, an air, I don't think you say that anymore. It's a, it's a whatever it is. It's the person that, that works on the airplane. Um, and, uh, you know, myself, we all have, we all do different things. It's a, it's a very diverse, it's a very diverse group. It's genuinely diverse in terms of our, what we all do. And as a consequence, as a consequence, there's, there's almost a kind of, um, we're just not too much in each other's lives to get, for it to get really fractious. And we don't own. Once you start owning, then you have more decisions to make. Then you have to decide on, what, are we going to repair the roof? And what are we going to do about, um, should we ha should we all agree on what pa door, what paint we should paint the doors, you know? And there's one decision after another. So that gets into another thing, which is what happens when you start to own and then what happens to your relationships because you're then protecting your interest. But let's get back to art. And so, because we're, we're here to talk about art. What does, what does community building of the sort that you have done very um, intentionally, you have constructed community, what does it do for the art itself? Because you have a very strong um, voice artistically. Did you need community to, su to support that voice? Well, I have to consult with my notes here a little bit. I, <laughs> and ask your own. I want to, because um, I, I want to stay relevant to you know, the issues, because I'm assuming everyone here is an artist. Um, but I feel that one of the things that we all want is attention for our work. And, and how, you, how do you get that? And especially if you're an extrovert like me, it's, it's relatively easy, but I have to throw myself off the cliff too. Um, so I can imagine if you're more introverted, but I have found that, for instance, when I first joined um, this sculptors group in the Bay Area, and it was really sort of the first time that I was, oh, did I, did we make a big mess here? <laughs> Don't worry, I'm busy, <laughs> I'm busy. You carry on, okay. Anne. <laughs> Is it, it was called the Pacific Rim Sculptors Group. And we all had different jobs, and this was, uh, this is when everyone had slides in three ring binders. And, um, and so I decided that I would volunteer to take the slides around to different curators. And it was a big job and it was like this, oh my gosh, they were like three milk cartons and they had some kind of a wheelie thing on it and they were heavy. And so you'd have to make an appointment, and that was just trying to get an appointment with someone was a big deal. And, uh, and then finally, when, you would, when somebody would finally say yes, but you know, I might have to make 10 or 15 calls. And then finally, Carrie Lederer out at the uh, Bedford Gallery would say, oh yeah, yeah, that, that's it's interesting to me. It might be good to do a show about sculpture. So here I am dragging these things in, and then I call her a couple weeks later, and she says, uh, yeah, it, it, this would be nice to do a show down the line, but I was really in interested in your work. And so she gave me a little small show in, uh, in the, kind of out in the lobby where there was a stairway and she let me just come up with a concept. So that was kind of when I first started to think, hmm, you know, this there's something to be said for this volunteering. So, that was a very immediate mm -hmm. response to my work. So I started to feel like I needed to be doing, I needed not just to be in a sculptor's group, but it s seemed like I needed to be involved with something in my city. And so um, I got involved with an advisory committee, which was in Emeryville. And, um, and then at another time, I was uh, I start I got involved with a public art program that was trying to get off the ground in Richmond, 
And what this did was it just put me in contact with so many different artists and contractors and uh, things that just opened up doors for me. So I started to feel like that was a really important thing. Because for one thing, you're getting out of your studio and you have to find ways to get out of yourself to, um, to have a meaningful life, really. Yeah, but let, what about the art itself? Because if you think, to, you and I were talking on a previous <coughs> occasion about, um, about communities of artists that have, that have forged movements. You know, if you think about the Impressionists, you know, they all knew each other, they drank together, they slept with each other's wives. Um, <laughs> They, um, you know, the same for the abstract <coughs> impressionists, you know, the Renaissance painters would have little groups in the studios of, Renaissance, of Florence or Rome or Venice or, um, you know, the Bloomsbury group. In, you, could, you could pick any city in the world where there's been historical art movements and you'll <laughs> often find a community of people who've hung out <coughs> together and... And they've, they've got competitive about their work. Their work has been influenced and, 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 and movements have emerged from those, that fusion of, of people at a certain time. Do you think your work that you do has in any way been... <coughs> are you okay? Do you want some water? I've got There some. we go. <laughs> it's leftover cold. Yeah. There's this um, cold going around. Yeah. Well, that is, that's a great question because I think that's a really romantic idea. And I, I think that it's something that we all just love the idea of, of going down to some dive bar like Alan, what, what was it called, Al's Bar in downtown Los Angeles. And it was, to me, it was probably, it sounds like according to some of the people that I know that were there, not, not, not you, Michael, but it seemed like a great excuse to just burn off steam and drink. And get nice oh, drink, and shit drink is a part of the story. Drink yes, I think it was. Yeah, but you know, then people. you have to get up the next morning and go to your part-time job and get back in your studio or you know get your kid to school and all those kinds of things. So I think that it's it's a romantic idea, and I don't think that I th I think that what I need for my artwork is connection with other people, right, and other artists, oh. and I. I have a studio at Angels Gate Cultural Center where there's 50 artists and we rent studio space. And, but oddly enough, I don't feel a strong sense of community there because no matter how many activities are there, that, whether they're openings or walkthroughs, it doesn't feel like there's very, very many of the studio artists that come to those events. So, one thing I'm talking to another artist about, who's a young artist in his maybe late 20s, who just got finished with Otis, and is just, you know, was used to having so much community and so much feedback about the artist, and he was feeling a little isolated, like, and I often feel isolated at Angelscape because we each have our own studios. So we're talking about in 2024, of just having a pizza night to to just see if people want to come and talk about art, or maybe he was more interested in a critique. I'm not interested in a critique. I don't care what any of you think about my work. <laughs> I'm going to just make it the way I want to make it for my last 20 years. Now it's down about 15. But um, but I do. I want to talk to somebody. I I, I want to you know run ideas back and forth, you know, like, how do you deal with, you know, somebody that won't pay you or the gallery that won't pay you or, how, you know, who do you use to transport your artwork that doesn't charge an arm and a leg? So those are the kinds of questions. And I think that I've created that, but it's almost kind of more one-on-one. -on -one. Although the other thing that I always have had is an art group. Like, and I like got the, the idea route. of mm -hmm. that through this book called Every Other Thursday. And they were scientists that were all women at Cal Berkeley in advanced fields of science. And they were wondering why they weren't getting tenure. I mean, th this was maybe like 20 or 25 years ago um, when they first started forming a group when 
they just felt like the women were being ignored in the science department. So they would just have a potluck and meet every other Thursday and problem solve and goal set. So I decided I was going to do that. So I did that with a group. Once I was in Emeryville, that was the other reason that I needed to come in from the country because this community was a baby about 20 minutes from Berkeley, 45 minutes from San Francisco. And I definitely needed to have to be more in a community of artists. But again, after Weber's Whiskey Wednesday, I continued that after I got into the group, but less and less people came till it was just me and this contractor guy that I knew the only reason he came is for the whiskey. And he just gnawed my ear off till finally no more Whiskey Wednesdays. So I, I think having a, a group and then that group got a little unwieldy for a while because I really wanted it to be not just where you come and you say, oh, I've had this great opportunity for a show or oh, I'm going to do this or somebody wrote a review about me. That's not so helpful to artists. What you need is problem solving and, and goal setting. And so I sort of presented that. But after a few years, I couldn't control the group anymore. So I just left, formed another group with a, with a and I wanted to have more age differences. So I started another group with a, she was in her early 20s. I was in, I think, my 50s then. And so we would bring together different people and, and sort of mentor each other in that way. And that was structured because the partner that I started it with, this woman, she kept notes on it. And then I kept a timer so that we would have, you know, if there were six of us, we would each talk for about 15 minutes. So that ended up being very helpful until until it wasn't. And, and then that went on for about 10 years. Even after I moved and different people went in different directions, Skype and then, you know, another one of the booms are, are these Zoom lectures. And being able to use Zoom and to communicate with each other in that way is another great, great thing. So now my group is just four of us. And one of them is leaving Los Angeles for the East Coast. And, um, and again, it's very, it's structured and it's about goal setting and problem solving. So I think that those are the kinds of things that are really most supportive of me as an artist. Yeah, that's really interesting. And by the way, speaking of timers, we're almost, uh, we've got in a couple of minutes, it's time for everybody to participate. But I, but it is interesting. I'll just, I'll just, just before we, we, Bert to the floor. It is interesting that you say that what you think is the most useful kind of feedback you want is is just the practical, you know, and not the um, you know, not the sitting around in the cafe getting very drunk and screaming about ideas, you know, because that that is the romantic ideal is is and maybe maybe that romantic ideal was was actually now I come to think of it, you know, maybe it was mainly male friends and maybe the wives were at home looking after the children you know that's conceivably partly what was going on and maybe maybe there was something of a um of a limited access to those circles i'm, I'm not sure i'm not sure i'm not going to speculate but but i do wonder in terms of just sort of art and where and where it's going if it's going anywhere is um I'm, I'm sort of intrigued that you want community, but within that community, you want to be somewhat in your own bubble with your art. You don't necessarily feel you need to be having a conversation artistically, but the more practical side is what you emphasized. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. That's just interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I think also I'm an old dog. <laughs> I think when you're younger, you you are more fired up about certain ideas. Yeah. And, you know, especially when you're coming out of school, because people are really arguing about different points of view, whether it should be conceptual, whether it should be abstract, you know, and, and also at one time in the art world, there really was just one way of doing things. You know, there was a movement, it was, whether it was uh, abstract expressionism or, or minimalism and then pop. And then, you know, one side didn't like the other side and 
Right, and then there'd be usually a prominent critic mm-hmm. who would be kind exactly. of at the centre and who would be a kingmaker and yes, yeah. yes, yeah. And it's it's much broader now. Yeah, no, it is, it is, and we haven't even talked about social media because you are very active on social media, and that's a venue that you have great command of. But also, that's also a venue where, frankly, you can put out questions like, "Can any of you tell me which is the best?" transportation service you know you, you could use social media to answer those practical questions if you wanted to well that is i feel a responsibility to my work and to my community to engage in social media and for instance when i have somebody that delivers my work and they're there on time and they handle it really carefully i'll take a picture of them and do a post about it, you know, with them moving the piece. And um, and I started, let, let me just touch on that for a minute, mm-hmm. because it really, yeah, it's interesting. It, it is, now I think of Instagram as being part of my community. Mm-hmm. And I, I had turned, looked on my nose at Instagram and kind of went kicking and screaming And then, of course, we had this great break with the COVID and nobody wanted to talk about their art. And then when COVID started to break up a little bit and I went back to Instagram and all of a sudden I realized I don't know anything about it. It's, you know, stories, reels. I said, I need a 30-year-old to help me get introduced to it again. So I found Nicole Slater, who is sitting right here in the red and white sweater, we ran into each other serendipitously. She makes the rounds, I make the rounds. That's another way that we all establish community is by going to each other's openings. And she and I met at Fresh Paint. And we just introduced ourselves. I was still, you know, relatively new to Los Angeles, still feeling very outgoing. I'm not quite as outgoing as I was. And then she's also an outgoing person too. So we started working together about three years ago, and the idea was that I would get up to speed on social media. And she had represented musicians, and she was sort of looking to get out of um, the the, uh, intense environment of working with musicians and trying to see what artists were like and how it might be to help people with uh, you know, broaden their perspective and get their, you know, help get their work out to a broader audience is what I talk about. And so Nicole has really helped me um, find my voice in social media, mm-hmm. I would say. And people say, and now I have 126,000 followers. Yeah, that's So that, I feel, well, is a responsibility. Mm-hmm. And it's something that's very useful because if I put a post up about working with Nicole, Nicole starts to get a bunch of followers. Ellen paid her a couple thousand dollars to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I paid you a couple thousand dollars. <laughs> Anyway, and that's back to how we first met. You see, that's what I remember most about our meeting was we had the lunch. It was a delicious lunch, by the way. So the lunch stays in my mind and the conversation. But then afterwards, you started instructing me about social media and telling me how important it was, which was true. I knew it was true. I just um, hadn't fully, you know, you know, realized it. But um but yeah, you're, you're extremely, again, you're very, very intentional about all of this. And so you probably, in another life, you probably could have marshaled an army. You know, you probably could have invaded a country or something. <laughs> but you've in fact applied those energies, those organizational abilities to building community within, within the art world, which is very, very interesting and, and, and impressive. But... Um, but let's. Oh, wait a minute. I got one oh, more thing I okay. want to say before we open it up. And, and one of the great things is that I found community in this gallery. And um, it's a longer story about how we found each other. But the thing that I really respect about Aiden Nelson and Alaya Parhezi is that they 
One of their core values is to encourage community here. And they want to make everyone feel welcome. And it's one of the reasons why they have always had a living room, which is a form of the word Wanzheimer, and because they want to open it up to people of all ages. I mean, they represent, they're, they're stable, which is small. I think maybe six artists. The youngest is 24, the oldest is me at 73. So that tells you something about a gallery right away. Also that we both really felt it was important to have, we had, we're having five events during the run of this six week show, which was a way to bring people together and to bring an audience into the gallery. And they have, an, uh, many of you know that they have a, uh, Open, they have a studio program of 13 studios that they rent out to uh, artists and that they rent this space out for performances, dances, movies, uh, musicians, and which is another way to bring people together. They, they have said that they are not really interested in showing work that is overtly political because it's offensive to certain and that's the goal of wanting people to come in and feel welcomed. Is that? Is there anything else to add, Aliyah? Where are you? No, that's perfect. Yeah, yeah. and I, I was. I thank you so much for bringing it up, Anne, because because it was on our list, absolutely to address. Your this space is fantastic. I mean, and especially as this room, the living room part of it, comes as such a surprise, because the gallery space hues to the conventions of a gallery space with the white walls and the art speaks and then you come in here and you're in you know the living the living room and you've got the old the 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 uh, upholstered chairs here that one can just sink into it it's just a whole other vibe and the paintings are much more um you know arranged it's, it's much more living room like what can one say and it's absolutely great and uh, well done it's wonderful space so and perfect for, for this kind of it reinforces the conversation we're having um so anyway does anyone want to ask a question or make a comment or i'd just like to say you know i think it's interesting you brought up the word the big word community because that's used so much now overused and, and um you know your work to me has a community feeling. The way it's made, the way it's structured with so many pieces, elements coming together. It's all about these shapes and these elements all coming together to me as a community. So I know you're talking about living community, but I think that word is also very appropriate to describe to describe your work. And this is and, the great Andre Mirapolsky. And thank you. <laughs> and and in, that, in that regard, you know, you're talking about the living space and everything and, and your the studio where you're at now, the co-op thing, no, no, the, the court was before. before. So what kind of a studio are you in now? I, you said you live in an apartment or something. No, no. I live in an apartment. She, she lives, in, lives in the apartment. I live in a single family house, which now I'm thinking, you know. But I also bring people into that house so that I can have an artist in resident come and stay in the second bedroom and then use part of my big studio space uh, usually once a year. That's part of my house, oh, yeah, right. this part the of my studio house, space. Space. but, I, but also I, I'm at Angels Gate Cultural Center where those are old barracks from World War II, and uh, lucky to have Susan Davis here who is on the board of directors there, and they provide subsidized studio space for 50 plus artists in San Pedro, so I'm very lucky to, to have a beautiful space on the top of a hill overlooking the Pacific Ocean on one side and the Port of Los Angeles on the other. So, so that's more like what I imagine because to me you're working very grand. So I, I feel mm. that it's probably it's Oh big, yeah. It's yeah. Big brand. Oh San Pedro suits me because it's so muscular and, and all those great big cranes. But you know, you're really right about the community because I I mean you can tell I'm a people person and that I, lo I love people. There's probably nothing more important to me than my friends and that I would starve. I, I would starve without 
my friends and and the communities, the the, the circles that I that I create, and uh, and in fact during this one period when I I uh, Leonard Cohen calls it a I had a period of obstacles where I was I was out of commission for a year, and I had no idea so many people loved me who came and helped me during that period. And so afterwards, I started a series which I called The Personages, and there's still some of them out there. And I started by just cutting out a shape on a big piece of cardboard, four by eight, I cut out a shape, and then right there was a, the other shape, and, it, and they went together. And then I kept going, and I did about 35 of them, and I thought of them as this phalanx of this, of this, all, all, all these people that came together to, to help me get through this period. But then I also felt that they had a more universal feeling because they were all made from the same thing, one after the other, and you could put them together in a group. And which is another way of working where you think you go after the most personal idea and you think, oh, that's nobody's going to relate to that. It's just so personal. But then the most personal is often the most universal. Yep. yep. Were, they, were they portraits of friends? No, they were shapes like out here. Just shapes, but, it was brought, but the idea came because so many people came to you and and helped me, made me dinners. You know, I don't think I cooked for a year, you know, brought me a juicer, just, you know, driving me here, driving me there, sitting with me, staying at my house overnight for four months. I'm talking about community and I see that there's, I see it in two different ways. There's the physical community, your neighbor, the person that lives next door, person that maybe lives down the street that you see you become friends with. I've had nightmare neighbors. <laughs> I've had yep. neighbors that, you know, they're what, you know, they're just a nightmare. I've had absolutely incredible neighbors that I'm friends with. But my community, when you talk about community, they are my friends. And that's what I, when I would never use the word community to describe my friends. And, my, and, and as you said, they're the most, they trump everything in my life. And as I get older, I get closer to my friends. I still make new friends. And I have friends that carry weight with me. And I have friends that carry very little weight with me. Okay. So when you say you don't want to hear maybe some critique about your work, sometimes I, I you know, should I do this or should I do that? And then I call on my friends that do carry weight with me to um, help me out. I'm very lucky now. I live in a building that I like everybody. <laughs> so I live at work around the corner in a, in a building that I live and like everybody. Oh, that's, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. Yeah, I, ha I have a friend who I call the doctor. Could the doctor come over and look at the patient? There's something wrong here. <laughs> Art, yeah, yeah. Oh, so you are, you yeah. are interested. Yeah, yeah, yeah but, not, but not as a group, you know. Oh, just right. as a, there's something wrong with this. I, my, my very favorite reference is that Grancuzzi and Man Ray were very, very, very best friends. Mm -hmm. And that two different people were best friends. There's a whole book, a documentation of how they met, the letters they sent to each other. And, you know, Man Ray taught Brad Cousy how to make photographs. Oh, mm -hmm. And that's the kind of people I want. And I always said, I can have those people in my life, and I do. Well, we do. Mm -hmm. They're just maybe not so famous. But, you know, I wanted to ask both Jill and um, Samuel, who live at the, at the brewery, Oh, you and you the also, brewery, uh, Andre? Yeah, well, oh, I would like to hear what your opinion is about the, the situation at the brewery. And do you... Does it nurture you? Absolutely. And talking about getting information and an opinion from another artist, a couple of years ago, I've told the story to other people. I had an opportunity to bid on a big metro job. And there were three of us competing for it. And it was during COVID. And 
I share my space with other people that rent from me, but they were all gone because of COVID. Everybody failed. But gave me the studio space all to myself. I live in Hollywood, so I drive in. And this big project came in. I'm in there every day. And this one and a couple other people, we had like this weird little pod just checking in with each other. But Andre and Theodore and anyway, what do you think of this? Oh, make that bigger. It, <laughs> it was fantastic. And it made the whole project really fun because it was a really daunting idea, this whole mm -hmm. big building. And I ended up winning the project. I won the bid. Yeah. Wow. wow. Yeah, but it's all on hold because of COVID. So, but, but the point was <laughs> working that whole summer on the drafting table, which is like my favorite thing, just prepping all this stuff. It was huge having a neighbor who could come by and say, make it green or whatever it was. It, it, it was just really good and really encouraging. My, my, my analog line for living in the community like a brewery is it's like living in a Rolodex. Remember those? <laughs> it is. That's the problem for me anyway. My, my experience, I've been there for 28 years now. Um, that's been the best thing about it is, is the access to uh -huh. so many other people that do so many other things that I don't do. But I, and if I need, I can visualize something, can see something find somebody that knows how to actually do that, it. That's absolutely true. That's a really great that's a really hook great. about being in that community. Yeah, that's a and big community. I've had a lot of other projects, not just that one, where I needed a woodworker. Oh, well, that guy can help me. Right. I needed somebody to do glass for that guy. Right. And it's, it's been great. Yeah. 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 Um, do you think there is a different level of friendship with someone that's also an artist because you do the same things? Or is there those levels of friendship with someone that's not an artist? Oh gosh! You know, I I I think that it's artists are as diverse as dentists. You know, I mean, I think that you know some of my best support is from a friend who's not an artist, and she loves the idea of everything that I do. And somebody says, "Oh, is Linda coming to your opening?" I say, "Well, no." But she's not that interested in that, you know, so, um, but I, I, I mean, we tend to really surround ourselves with artists. I mean, don't you? Yeah, I was just wondering that's like, if there's like a different level of friendship to that, that you can like relate to doing the same thing compared to a dentist. They do the same <laughs> thing, but they don't relate on it so much, I guess. They're not necessarily friends because they're dentists. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I, but then I, one of my dentists was. He always, I always sent him cards, and he always commented, and it's on my mailing list. But um, you know, I don't, I don't know. I think that I think that brilliant people come in all forms, uh -huh. and interesting people come in. Like one of my best friends, she's a doctor. She's an AIDS doctor. She, um, but she first had her doctorate in Russian culture. So she's one of the most interesting people I know, and she's, her doctoring is certainly an art, but she's, you know, she's a, um, an infectious disease doctor. Mm -hmm. And when we sit, we don't stop talking for hours. Oh, so. what were you going to say, Nicole? I was just going to add, you know, I work with artists, and one of the things I, I tell them is that there's something so romantic about being an artist to a non-artist, to a non-creator and sharing that on social media that I get to wake up every day and I get to create whatever I want. No one's telling me what to do. I can move clay or paint and I can just express what's inside of me. So many people are jealous of that. So many people are so terrified to do that. It's such a vulnerable and beautiful, expressive thing. So I think it really does connect people who are either too afraid or too busy or too tired or maybe not even that interested, but they can really appreciate someone's vulnerability to be creative. And so like as artists, I think it connects us with non-artists. Uh, we're looking at two sides of the same coin of just wanting to be more vulnerable. I find that's, the, that's a myth though, that people, right? will, people, will, people will say to me, Oh, you're not. Oh my God, you're so lucky. And that implication <laughs> is that I have a very easy life. That, that I get to wake up and it's do whatever. You have to pay rent, right? And that I still want to put bread on my table. I, you know, like I, 
is we work our asses off yeah. to make this happen. And so the implication is like, oh my God, you're so lucky. Yeah, I don't have to do a nine to five, but I may do a four to three in the morning, you know, and then I've got to ship it out at nine. But I think that's what Nicole is exactly referring to, is actually the issue. Well, well, that, well, that may be why, again, artists, when I, I, would, I would put into that, um, under that umbrella, musicians, um, uh, writers, anyone that gets up in the morning and is faced with the blank page and says, how am I going to fill this? Or, or I must fill this, I am driven to do this. The sheer will to create something from nothing is what seems to be a, quite a distinguishing trait from someone who goes to work for the, at the bank. And of course, the bank manager can be an incredibly interesting person who you want to have dinner with, absolutely. But that, just, that, just that community of people who are driven to create. I will say that's something coming from, from the UK or from, you know, if I just speak collectively for Europe, leaving aside England and its own Brexit issues. If I say as a, as a person from sort of the, from the old Europe, you really do generate, if you if there really is a kind of, a, a kind of, um, you just grow up feeling you'll pretty much do what your parent, your father did. You know, your father was a lawyer, so I'll be a lawyer. Your father was a plumber, so I'll be a plumber. Literally, my father's father was a plumber, and everybody in the family was a plumber. My father actually wanted to be an artist, and he actually wound up kind of leaving home to go and break away from a family of plumbers. But anyway, you get to L.A., and L.A. is this incredible place that's, to me, what always struck me on a first visiting in, in the late 80s was just all these people that were just doing their thing. You know, I couldn't believe it. All these people had sort of given up on this idea of just doing the job that their parents did. And they were just seekers. They were seekers. And they were seeking often some kind of artistic expression. And I found it incredibly inspiring, actually. But also, obviously, not everybody makes it. And some people are, you know, holding down three jobs at the same time. And yes, trying to figure it out, you know, and find some time perhaps at 4 a.m. in the morning to do the idea. But, but, but a community of people just driven is, I think, maybe can, can be a bond. But that doesn't, by any stretch, exclude at the dinner table the dentist or the person doing the com on, on, a, on a different track. Because I think it's fun to have eclectic dinner parties. You had a question. Yeah, more specifically for you and your practice. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm just curious, like, I would love to hear more about the arc of your art career and kind of like what the what it looked like or how many moments have you like found your voice? Have you had moments where you felt like you lost your voice? How did you find it again? I would just love to hear about like the trajectory of your career because it you know, I hope to have one that spans oh, as long as well. Oh, thank you. Well, you know, it's really a long story, and I don't know if you live nearby and are not doing anything next Friday night, but I'm just going to show slides from when I lived in upstate New York and had a pottery studio and an old grocery store, and we built a kiln in the backyard from a book and uh, lived behind the curtain for about a year and a half until we couldn't stand it anymore. Then we built a yurt down these train tracks and uh, <laughs> no, no more train, but, um, and then would, would come to the studio. So that started 50 years ago. And then here I am having a solo show in Los Angeles and I was born in Indiana, and I, I thought of myself as this little country person that would never get out from under my conservative parents and living in a town where everybody was Protestant and everybody was white. And if you were Jewish, that was like foreign. And, and I, just, I just can't believe that, that I 
that I have been through all these different things living in New York City. I always had a part-time job, um, but I, I never worked full-time because I knew that, and that if I did that, I wouldn't have enough time in my studio. And, and I had to pull my weight. And, and so I, I felt like there was a lot of struggles. You know, husbands do not like artists who are just going off on some cockamamie adventure to go to an artist's residency and not be home for dinner and wanting to go to the sculptor's group. And, you know, they, and, and especially from my generation, there, it just didn't feel like I ever found somebody that was a true partner that would let me, you know, create, that would help me create my own opportunities. It, it was the opportunities that it was for the husband. And so, you know, the marriage fell apart, the second one, and then I had no idea how I was really going to uh, take care of myself. And then this friend of mine from graduate school says, oh, there's this job at this art center for people with disabilities. Let's propose a job share. So we did that and we got it. And, and the person that was working there before, another friend from graduate school, she was making 40000 So we thought, well, we could each get 20000 Well, no, they took it back down to, you know, I think we were making 15000 a piece. And one of us got the health insurance and the other got the uh, I don't know what it was, a, you know, like a 401k or something. And so I got the health insurance. And uh, so, you know, just all these kind of, it's just like you, just, you want two steps forward and two back. And then, and then somehow you just, you know, something comes your way. I applied for a grant and uh, the California Arts Council gave me $5,000 in 1998. And man, that was just so validating. And I think I spent it three times um, because you just, you know, you think, well, maybe they'll be, maybe I will be able to make a little bit of money. But the other thing is that I, my art has never supported me. I have only supported it. And it's either with real estate, you know, betting on something that nobody else wants and then turning, you know, straw into gold. It, but, you know, I, I never wanted a traditional job. And, uh, and that started early on, you know, because I was a hippie, for one thing. And I really loved an alternative lifestyle, even if it meant, uh, you know, not having very much money. But I also kind of prided myself because, you know, anybody can look good that's got some money or anybody can make beautiful sculpture out of marble and bronze, but it's the clever person that make, can make sculpture out of strips of cardboard boxes. And it's the clever person that can go to a thrift store, get out the sewing machine and make yourself look as good as anybody else. So I always sort of prided myself on that. A friend of mine, he'll say, they, they have the money, <laughs> That's a good your, your, your friend has a point. Can I just one little question? Um, so all these are cardboard. You, oh. paint, you paint it all white, you paint it's all white. No, they, uh, no, no, the cardboard comes in all colors of the... So no. all, all these repeated elements, those, those are all by... It's from the cardboard. It's from the cardboard. It is all yeah. cardboard? Yeah. yeah, the red is from the red cardboard. Well, that was my question because, it, I mean, yeah, no, they're Trader Joe's wine boxes. And if you go to Europe and you're getting Italian wine boxes, they're even more beautiful. Yeah, but, but, you, have to, but you have to put those together so that all, all those design elements make sense like She's that. an artist. She's an artist. <laughs> it's, it's there. It's amazing. It's wild. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have, we, we have really stretched your, your patience. It's 8.30. It's 8.30. We are, we are cutting this off. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>
<laughs> it's so much fun to just talk. It's like therapy without having to pay. You get to talk about yourself. And thank you and so much. And it's so comfortable. Oh, yes. And Francis, it's such a pleasure yes. to have you here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You likewise. really, it's wonderful. Thank likewise, you. Likewise, likewise. No, Anne, it's, it's such a pleasure. Thank you.